Hello, welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero, and I have a kitty. So, we have come to August of 1991, and issue number 27 of Nintendo Power. We are a quarter of the way through Nintendo Power's first, uh, fourth year, rather, and more importantly, we are one issue away from the launch of the Super Nintendo. Now, this issue has two RPGs, and the final installment of a classic trilogy of NES games. Technically two classics, but one is more well-known in the States than the others. And we've also got, well, well, because of these two RPGs, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Our cover game this issue is Mega Man in Dr. Wily's Revenge for the Game Boy. It's our first diorama cover in in a while, and I really like the look of this one, with Dr. Wily and his battle pod being the focus of the cover this time, as opposed to the blue bomber. It looks really good. Our letters call on this issue has a question on when Canadian fans can get hold of this of the SNES. Unfortunately, Nintendo currently only has enough machines to hit a fall release date in the US, and just the US. It's kind of an interesting historical tidbit. Nowadays, when you get North American launches of consoles, you get them launched all over the U.S. U.S., USA, Canada, um, usually even Mexico, though not ne- though not as necessarily, all tend to get them at about the same time, more or less, maybe a, within a month or so, or a few weeks of a gap between the two. We come now to our first game of the issue, Ninja Gaiden 3, the final installment of the original Ninja Gaiden trilogy. We start off with a description of the game's opening cutscene, with an imposter posing as Ryu Hiyabusa appearing to kill Irene Liu, with Ryu having to find the imposter and clear his name. The guide itself gives a rundown of the game's power-ups, and of note this time, as far as changes, the Shadow Clones from Ninja Gaiden 2 are gone, taking its place as a power-up that extends your sword's attack range. It's not a great replacement, certainly not an equivalent replacement in terms of the level of power it gives the player, but still, it's a nice change uh, in terms of it's a useful power and definitely handy. The guide itself has complete maps of the first four acts, though without the complete screenshots of the cutscenes we had for the first two games. We also have broader overview maps of levels 5 through 6. Ninja Gaiden 3 is, in a lot of ways, superior to the last two games. When you hit an enemy's respawn point, they only spawn once. I'll repeat that, rephrased. If you go backwards to take out an enemy, causing the spawn point the enemy came from to move off screen, and then move forward again, the enemy won't respawn. Considering respawning enemies is the root of some of the more bullcrap elements of the difficulty in Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2, this is a dramatic change for the better. Additionally, Ryu has some new abilities to help him traverse the environment better. In addition to being able to cling to and climb up walls, he can also hang on to some objects in the environment and either pull himself up or climb beneath them hand over hand. That said, the game has developed some new problems. For example, the way damage is handled has changed somewhat. Environmental obstacles and some regular enemies deal more damage in one hit than some bosses do in one hit. I appreciate the game trying to compensate for reuse and improve mobility by upping difficulty in other ways, but just increasing the amount of damage you receive isn't actually changing difficulty in any real fashion. It's just increasing the punishment for failure, which isn't the same thing. That said, combined with how dis- uh, how distant the checkpointing is, and the, er- and the damage issues as well, it prevents the game from achieving perfection but it still keeps it as an excellent game and certainly one of the best titles in the NES's library. This time in Nestor's Adventures, Nestor's providing a tip for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, while trying to find his mom's keys. You know, I really kind of miss the in-universe bits from Howard and Nestor. Additionally, aside from not having things be in the game worlds themselves, which adds a bit of flair and makes the tips seem to come more naturally, Nestor really needs a consistent, straight person to work off of. Like what Howard served earlier. If Nestor's mom takes that role, it could work. 
we'll see. In classified information, we have a couple codes of note. We have some level warps for battle toads, and a variety of cheats for the NES version of the Hunt for Red October. Next, as we approach the end of the NES's life, the final Famicom Dragon Quest game has reached the U.S. under the title of Dragon Warrior 3. We start off, however, with some advice in finding items in Dragon Warrior 2, including how to find the five chests. Moving on to Dragon Warrior 3, we got a world map for the main world, which looks a lot like a modified map of Earth, along with notes on each of the seven classes of the game and their attributes, strengths, and weaknesses. We also get notes on most of the game's quests, but no information on item stats or dungeon maps or anything like that. In some significant ways, Dragon Warrior 3 is an improvement on Dragon Warrior 2. In other ways, it's more of the same, but no real steps back. The game gives you a party of multiple characters from the very beginning of the game, instead of you having to gather them through traveling through the world and then having to level them up separately, leading to uneven leveling. Or rather, leveling them up as a party, leading to uneven leveling. However, it's still got the Dragon Quest grind, and it's still got some of the graphical shortcomings of earlier games, like having a combat take place on a plain black screen, having attacks against enemies who have died be wasted, meaning you're penalized for prioritizing dangerous targets. So, I'd say that the gameplay innovations for the Super Famicom version, which deal with the retargeting problem and gives you a background for when you're fighting enemies, definitely makes this game a lot more playable. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch of RPG questions, particularly some on navigating the dungeons in Dragon Warrior 2 and finding the stones in Ultima 4 Quest of the Avatar. Next up is Darkman, a licensed game from Ocean adapting Sam Raimi's first superhero film. The article has maps of each of the game's levels, which often have very little to do with the plot of the movie. Dark Mad feels like a bad port of a Amiga or Spectrum game, and considering that this is from Ocean, who is primarily developer of games for the Amiga or the Spectrum, that's not too surprising. Dark Man has the acceleration of a character from one of those systems. He seems to slide along the ground instead of having his move animation reflect his speed, and the way that goes from 0 to 60 almost instantly, reminds me of what happens if you try to take movement designed for a joystick, where there are intermediary levels of movement, and port that to a D-pad. Now again, this makes sense, Ocean's background is for the Amiga and the Spectrum, and this is entirely possible that this is a port of a Amiga or Spectrum game, because I know that there's a Darkman game for those systems by Ocean, and this entirely could have been and this game could have actually been made for those systems first, so my earlier mention about the bad port part is correct. But again, because this is a bad port, not a good port, the controls are not well adapted to reflect the nature of the D-pad, which is what most people playing in NES are going to be using. And I'm using a D-pad, not something like the NES Advantage. So, take the bad movement, take the floaty, flaky jump physics, and add that with equally bad combat, with no real rhythm, no way to stun enemies when you hit them, while enemies are able to stun you and knock you off ledges, and you get a game that is the antithesis of what makes an enjoyable platformer, whether it's just a conventional platformer or an action platformer. I am starting to come to the opinion that while LJN has an extremely poor track record on the NES, the fact of the matter is, Ocean's track record just might be worse. In terms of being consistently terrible. Moving on from Ocean to Capcom, we come to Mega Man for the Game Boy. And the first Mega Man Game Boy games, to be specific. The little bit of box art we get in the article, which shows Mega Man, looks terrible. The whole combination of the face and the mismatch between the upper and lower body makes the character look pretty bad. I kind of prefer the Mega Man 2 box art by comparison. 
The article itself gives information on the recommended boss order and some level maps for each of these robot masters and the early portion of Dr. Wily's Fortress. Now, the Mega Man games on the NES are justly lauded with their grippy, precise controls, finely tuned difficult, and brilliant level design. This version is unfortunately lacking those precise controls, which hurts everything else. I really wanted to like this, but unfortunately, it doesn't quite have what it takes. The controls are just a little too floaty, a little too imprecise for what you're needing to do, and it leads to cheap hits and cheap deaths and excessive amounts of damage. It's almost there, but it's not quite. Um, and by, to be clear, this is not a good almost there, but not quite, but you're on the cusp of perfection. You're on the, you're on the cusp of just being good. To be fair, the NES Mega Man games are widely considered to not have hit their stride until the second installment of the series, so we'll see what happens when we get there to Mega Man 2 for the Game Boy. Continuing with our Game Boy coverage, we get our second RPG and the second installment of the Final Fantasy Legends series. Most of the classes from the first game are back, plus a couple new ones. Um, you have the Demon Critter, or Demon Critter, or what have you. The structure of the game has also been tweaked somewhat as well. To advance up each level of the tower, you need to gather up all the magi from each world of the tower. Now, this game doesn't necessarily change up the core gameplay from the last game as much as it rebalances the monsters and scenario design to create a much more streamlined experience. This makes for a game that works better in bite-sized chunks and is generally a much more portable, friendly gameplay experience. Um, from the research I did in this game, the developers were trying to design a game that could theoretically be beaten in 10 hours, as opposed to most RPGs which shoot for somewhere more in the 40-hour uh, range, on average, even in the NES era. And I think that this was a good design decision to do, and is definitely a step in the right direction for the Saga series. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want something that short, but not in the sense of, oh, you have to grind more, but more in the sense of this game has enough content to it, world to explore, for another five to ten hours. But again, hardware restrictions, Game Boy cartridges are small, I dig it. Our third and final Game Boy game of the issue, for that matter, our final game of the issue, is Days of Thunder, a licensed game based on the NASCAR film starring Tom Cruise. The article has maps of each of the tracks. I'll say this for this game. When Forza Motorsport for the Xbox 360 was announced as having a cockpit view, a full-on cockpit, you are behind the driver's seat, you see the gauges and everything like that, windshield, the whole thing. It was considered new and novel. I was very, very surprised to find with this game, races were played entirely within the cockpit view. That said, I'm not a fan of cockpit views, as the camera perspective, at least at present, doesn't provide enough peripheral vision to allow the player the same amount of information they would have with the camera perspective that's slightly behind the car. This is aggravated by the fact that due to the graphical limitations of the Game Boy hardware, there aren't really any textures to define, to define the walls of the track and to give the tracks any sort of character. Further, the hardware limitations of the Game Boy cause some draw distance as well. Are oh, there some problems with the draw distance? I wouldn't describe this game as being a must-own. Um, Certainly, if you're a collector and you're going for a full set of all Game Boy games, you're going to want to pick this up anyway, whatever. But, if you're looking for games that are interesting from a game design standpoint, this is certainly an interesting title. If you're looking for a game that's just, oh, this is a really fun game I want to play, this might be worth a miss. In the Game Boy Classified Information column, we get a few codes for a Mysterium to help you get through the game a little quicker. 
Continuing with our preparation for the release of the SNES, we have previews of Super Mario World, Gradius 3, and Act Razor. Not much of note in the now playing column this time, with the most notable title being a strategy RPG from Hudson. In the top 30 column, Monopoly is entering, or re-entering the list, along with Dick Tracy. Next in our Celebrity Profile column, we have a legit big name this issue. We haven't gotten one since probably Robin Williams uh, earlier. We have Macaulay Culkin, who, as of this publication of this issue, is fresh off of the first Home Alone movie. And as of now, at present, present day when I'm recording this, He's been most recently on the Jim Gaffigan show, along with being on Robot Chicken in various roles for almost five years. Um, wrapping things up in Packwatch, we have some screenshots of the ultimately unreleased title Bioforce Ape, along with advanced coverage of two more SNES games, Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past and Super Castlevania IV, both of whom will be future cover games. Well, we've only got five games this issue, so I'm going to do slightly different picks this time with my normal pick of the issue and a special Retron 5 pick, which is for a game worth getting if you have a Retron 5, by which I mean one where it's worth importing from, well, Japan, getting the, getting the um, getting a Famicom or Super Famicom version of the game and playing it that way with a translation patch. My normal pick is Ninja Gaiden 3. It is certainly a game which has its flaws, but it is an excellent installment in the series, and in spite of its issues, it is still a fantastic action platformer. My Retron 5 pick is Dragon Quest 3. In particular, get it for the Super Famicom. It is much, much more affordable to get it for the Super Famicom and run it with the translation patch than it is to get the NES version, which will cost you a very, very significant chunk of change. Additionally, the Super Famicom version does have some gameplay innovations, which makes it a much more enjoyable and just fun experience than just playing it on the NES. So, next installment of Nintendo Power Retrospectives, we will finally enter the Super Nintendo era, the 16-bit generation. We go from playing with power to playing with superpower. I hope you will join me for that. If you enjoyed the show, please support my Patreon. We now have a Patreon. We now have a Patreon backpacker who we would like to thank deeply and who will be mentioned in the credits. If you too wish to have your name in the credits of the show, please click the Patreon link up here above the video if you're on my YouTube channel, or toss some money in the tip jar if you can't necessarily afford to sp to put the long-term expense of uh, a Patreon backing. Uh, or for that matter, just like, subscribe, and share the video with your friends. All the cool kids are doing it. Till next time, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you then.